there are certain times whereby we get confused in the Bible simply because we have not decided firmly in our mind who God is, all right? In our church, I think many of you know this very well, we say that God is good and that He is good all the time, right? Remember, we, I mean, I think uh, thousands of churches say this as well, this, the same thing that we say here. God is good and He is good all the time. So let us just examine that statement that we just made. So in other words, what we are saying is that God is good, that means He is not bad. Correct? God is good means that God is not bad, so God is good. And just to be sure that we really understand it, we say, and He is good, come on, all the time. That means, first of all, we say God is not bad, and then secondly, we say that God is good all the time, meaning that God is not good some of the time, or God is good 90% of the time, or God is not good 98% of the time, but God is good 100% of the time. In other words, there is no badness in God at all. All right? So God is good, and God does say himself of this. All right? So God is good, and he is good 100% of the time. There is no badness at all in God. Okay? That's basically what we are saying, what we are confessing when we say this. All right? So therefore, when we read something in the Bible which seems to suggest otherwise, that means something is wrong in what we are reading. That means we are not interpreting Scripture, we are not reading our Bible correctly. So for example, if you think you read something in the Bible which says that God gave you a disease, God gave you something, now, what does that mean? All right, even if you do not read the Bible, for in this instance, let us say you, in your mind, you say, okay, God gave me cancer. All right, so what did we just confess with our mouth? God gave me cancer. But on the other hand, with the same mouth, we are stating God is good and He is good all the time. So when you put the two statements together, how do you reconcile this? One of these statements must be false, right? So if God is good and He is good 100% of the time, that means He cannot give you cancer because cancer is not good for you. So if cancer is not good for you, how can we then say that God gave me cancer? So either God did give you cancer and therefore God is not good and He is not good all the time or He's good some of the time, so other times He gives me cancer. So somewhere you have to decide and stand upon what you believe in. So is God really good all the time or He is not good all the time? And I know for many of us, we proclaim and we confess with our mouth that God is good all the time. So therefore, that statement, the second statement, that God gave me cancer, cannot be true, all right? So cancer is not given by God. Okay, now we come to Scripture, and let us read something where it seems to indicate something else, all right? So let's read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Okay? A very familiar scripture. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure. This is Paul writing. Okay? Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a... Come on. Torn in the flesh. 
the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. All right? So here is one particular scripture in the Bible where Paul talks about something that is coming against him. All right? So once again, lest I should be exalted above measure. All right? We'll go through all of this scripture first. Through the abundance of revelations, Paul was given an abundance of grace revelations, all right? So, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So, people have struggled with this, well, since they got hold of the English translation of the Bible. So, they said, look, there was given to me, somebody gave this to me, a thorn in the flesh. And people say, what can that be? A thorn in the flesh. So what is a thorn in the flesh? So people say, well, I don't understand this. But something must be wrong with Paul. Something must be wrong with Paul because he has, as in the scripture, a thorn in the flesh. So, and then they read on, messenger of Satan, lest I should be exalted. Wow! So here is the common explanation, all right? God gave to Paul a disease to humble him. Lest Paul, because that's what it says, lest I should be exalted. So just in case Paul becomes too proud, God gave him a disease. And everybody accepted it because it sounded pretty good. You're proud, God will send a disease to you, and therefore the disease is to humble you. Look, isn't that what it says? Yes, oh, you, you, you guys don't like it, I know. But look at it carefully, isn't that what it says? Look, I've just taken one verse out and it says, look, he has been given revelations and there was somebody gave him a thorn in the flesh, so therefore he should not be exalted. So he should be humble. Exalt, humble. So that's the definition. Now, the moment you, let us say you say, look, that's what it says in Scripture. God gave Paul a disease to humble him. Therefore, now you can transpose this to all the other things which happens around you. Well, God gave that woman a, a problem, a disease, to humble her. God gave that man cancer to humble him. God gave, then, of course, when things happen to you, God gave me cancer to humble me. And then, of course, <laughs> the, the, the ridiculousness of all of this logic is the moment you say, God gave me cancer to humble me, then why do we pray against cancer? I mean, that particular cancer. It makes absolutely no sense if God gave me cancer to humble me, I should thank God for the cancer. Because God gave it to me for a purpose. And the purpose is to what? To humble me. So why do I need prayer to get healed from cancer? So you see, in our minds, we have got so confused about who God is, how we read the Bible, that we can actually, in our minds, accept this dichotomy, this dual uh, situations which are not coming together, but we accept both of them. We accept good, and then we accept bad as well. You know the good news, bad news things? We sort of accept both of them. It's like, you know, your pastor coming up and says, you know, well, we just baptized 10 people, you know, in the river down by, in Brookfield. Wow, good news, 10 people got baptized. And then the bad news is that, well, two of them got swept away by the current, and we do not know where they are. All right, and we accept both of them and we say, yeah, you know, oh, two of them. Well, good news, bad news. Well, so what, you know? 
Yeah, or like uh, the one which I personally like, you know. Oh, church attendance double last Sunday, you know. Well, why? Because the, the pastor and all the elders were not in church. They were on vacation. All right, so the good news, and then you have the bad news, okay? But we accept both of them. We, we accept both of them. So somewhere, something must be wrong. You see, it cannot have good news and bad news all mixed together. It's either good news or it's bad news. And we have to make up our mind whether this is the truth or it's not. If it's not, that, or even if we read it like it's bad news, that means we are reading something wrong here. And that is why we have to read the Bible carefully. Otherwise, we will end up very, very confused. All right? I remember one time in uh, another church, they, they said, you know, whoa, good news, the women's softball team, you know, they finally won after, you know, 20 years of playing softball. Never won. And they finally won, you know. And then bad news was, well, they beat the men's softball team in the same church. So, so you see, you, somewhere you have to reconcile what is this good news that we are talking about? The good news, the gospel, eugelion, all right, as we define it so many, many times before, means the gospel means good news. There is no bad news in the good news. But somewhere along the way, we learn that both of these can coexist. Good news and bad news can coexist together in our brain, but not in Scripture. All right? So we have to clearly learn how to separate these two. Orthotomio, the word of truth, as we talk about in How to Read Your Bible, Part 1. All right. So let's go back to this. A thorn in the flesh. You see, it's very hard to say what the thorn in the flesh is. So some people went through, uh, you know, all those letters which Paul wrote, and they said, let's discover if Paul really suffered from some things, all right? So I found some things in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, verse 13 to 15, all right? So I'm going to point it out to you just in case um, you want to know where it is. Galatians 4, starting from verse 13. You know how through infirmity of the flesh, aha, infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Hmm, well, we don't know what the at the first means, but I can see through infirmity of the flesh. You see, Paul is suffering from something. Next verse. And my temptation which was in my flesh, you despise not. Okay, you know, he's something wrong with his flesh. You didn't despise it nor rejected it, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So Paul went out there to preach and he's talking about something in his body. All right, what is it? We, where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, so this is Paul talking to the people, to the Galatians, you would have... Ah, he's talking to the Galatians. What do you think he's talking about? He says, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have what? Given them to me. Aha, we know the problem with Paul. He has weak eyes. Look, Paul actually said that. Paul, Paul is saying, look, you know, I came, I'm preaching to you, you know, and there's some weakness in my body. And what is he talking about? He says, look, I bear you record. I know you guys love me, all you Galatians, but look, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me because Paul has weak eyes. Aha. And then, look, I found another one to support this. Galatians 6, verse 11. Okay, so he's written the book to the Galatians. He says, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. 
You see, when he wrote, this is the interpretation, all right, of him having weak eyes, you see how large a letter, you know, so Paul is on his uh, pre-Windows computer, and he's changing the font of the letter he's writing, okay, so he's writing, you know, he can write small letters, or he can write large letters. So because Paul has weak eyes, he writes to the Galatians in large letters because Paul cannot see. So, he, you know, uh, he, that's the first, uh, what, uh, what do you say, large letter? You know you, how you have large letter Bibles because you, you cannot see? Large print, yeah. So this is the first large print letter and Paul admits to it. Now, you see, is that really what it means? You, you, you can interpret it that way, but somehow or other, I don't think that is what it meant. Now, what do you think this would mean? You see how large a letter. In other words, man, Paul says, do you see how long a letter I have written to you? It's a very large letter. You know, that means I've written quite a bit to you, Galatians. He doesn't mean the letters, the alphabets that he's writing in Greek, he's writing in large letters. It means he has written a lot. All right? Now, the other passage on his eyes, when he went to preach to the Galatians, all right? If you go back to the book of Acts, Paul went through a lot of persecutions, all right? He was stoned, he was beaten, he, was, he went through a lot. And when he went from one place to another, all right? In this case, you know, you, you don't have to turn there. Lystra to Derby and so on. Some of those places, he was stoned. They actually took him out because he was preaching all the revelations which he received from Jesus. Paul preached grace. That means Jesus plus nothing else. And the people didn't like that, so they took him out, throw him outside the cities, and took up stones and stoned him. All right? So after he was stoned, he would move on to the next place and preach grace again. Now, tell me, how do you think Paul will look like after he's been beaten, probably kicked, punched, and stoned? How do you think Paul will look like in his face, in his eyes? Come on, just, just tell me. If somebody were to punch him, kick him, stone him in the face and his body, how do you think he will look like when he's preaching in the next town? <laughs> Yeah, his eyes will be not so good. His mouth is not so good. You know, he has cuts and bruises all over. Why? Because that was what happened to him. And Paul says this all the time. This is what happened to me. I was persecuted. I was beaten. I was shipwrecked. I, everything that could go wrong with me, yes, it went wrong because the people were against the message which I was preaching. So that is why he says, I come to you, Look at me, look at my body. It seems to be weak. My eyes, they are not what they used to be because of what I went through. So when you read about this, people are trying to find what's wrong with Paul. There's nothing wrong with Paul. So what do you mean by a thorn in the flesh then, all right? So this is how Bible interpretation goes. People don't know what a thorn in the flesh is, so they went and looked for a problem with Paul. They found these two verses, all right, which I found. I'm sure there might be others. And then they say, look, Paul's eyes, that's what's the problem with him. But then how do you justify it? This is the eyes of Paul, right? And what does the Bible say? He has a thorn in his? In his flesh, in his sight. So some people say, well, now what does that mean? Is this a thorn in your sight? I mean, if it's something wrong with your eyes, do you think it's something wrong with his flesh, with his body? You know, so how do you read the Bible then? 
How do you interpret the Bible? Well, we know God is good. So what does Paul mean when he says a thorn in the flesh? Now, when you are not sure of something, you ask the Holy Spirit. Remember I told you, if you read something inside or you read something out of the Bible, both of them are your own interpretations. All right, I told you in the first time, People say, if you go to Bible school, they tell you, well, you have to read the Bible exegesis style, all right? Meaning you draw the meaning out. And then the other one is eisegesis, which is you put your own interpretation in and say, no, no, don't do that. But both of them require you to do it. And I'm telling you, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So if you ask the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will tell you what something in the Bible means. Now, because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, so of course the first thing which a pastor does or should do is, instead of listening to other worldly voices, is to go and find out what the Holy Spirit actually said about this. So if you go to Numbers, all right, three scriptures here. Numbers 33, 55. Numbers 33, 55. Numbers 33, verse 55. All right. Let us read what is written in the Bible by the Holy Spirit. All right. If you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, all right, so he's talking about all those people living in the land. He says, okay, look, you Israelites, when you go in there, you drive out all the inhabitants from before you. Then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain, all those people who remain in that land, which you are you're supposed to drive them out. But if you let them remain, those of you, that, those, the ones who remain, shall be what? Pricks in your eyes and, come on, thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. So here comes the first scripture. If you let all those people whom you're supposed to drive them out remain, they will become thorns in your eyes and thorns in your sides. So is this a disease? Okay, the question once again. Is this referring to a disease? The thorn in the side? No, what does it refer to? People, right? People. So people can be pricks in your eyes, that means thorns in your eyes, or they can be thorns in your sides. That's how the Bible defines it. Now, let me show you something else which I taught you uh, along the way. This is what we call the law of first mention in the Bible. All right? What does the law of first mention say? If you want to know the meaning of a particular word in the Bible or particular phrase in the Bible, the first time it is mentioned in the Bible, there will be an interpretation for that meaning. And once you know that's the meaning, when the Bible uses that word again and again throughout the rest of the Bible, that is the meaning, as it is first mentioned in the Bible. That's what we call the law of first mention in the Bible. In other words, if it is defined thorns in your sight as referring to people, as the Bible goes along and Anytime you hear the word thorn in your sight, it refers to the people the first time it was mentioned in the Bible. All right? So that means the meaning does not change in the Bible. Do you all understand this? Remember in Genesis where it says, the seed will be given. So who is the seed? Jesus. So, of course, there are different types of seeds and so on. But the seed refers to Jesus, and it was given in Genesis. So that was the definition of the seed. So every time you see the seed in the Bible, that one special seed in the Bible, right on 
to the New Testament where the seed was planted, who do you think it refers to? Jesus. So the, the definition doesn't change once it's been given. Law of first mention. This is the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, the thorn in your sight. All right? So let's go to the next one where we find thorn in your sight. Joshua 23, 13, and then the next one, Judges 2 to 3. All right? Let's just read through this. Joshua 23, 13. For a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you. All right? Who are they referring to? People, right? And scourges in your sight, all right? And in some translation, thorns in your sights, thorns in your eyes, until you perish off from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. All right? Let's go to Judges 2, 3. Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sight, all right? And their God shall be a snare unto you. So these are the three parts of the Bible where it refers to thorn in your sight as people. All right? So now we go through the Bible right to back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. All right? Let's go back to that particular verse first, verse 7, before we do the whole uh, chapter. Now, so... Now, let's read this and see whether your eyes, your brain, your spirit has a fresh revelation here. All right? So let's read. Lest I should be exalted. Okay, you do not understand that one yet because we haven't dealt with the verses which came before it. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So somebody gave him a what? A thorn in the flesh. And what did we say a thorn in the flesh was? People. Now look at the continuation of that. So who do you think the thorn in the flesh is? Come on, read the next line. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. That means to persecute me, to punch me. Does it make sense now, this scripture? You see, the Holy Spirit has now revealed to you what is the meaning of that particular phrase, the thorn in the flesh. Without going back and seeing how the Holy Spirit defined it at the start, we could also have stated, hey, this is a disease. It could be his eyes, it could be his kidneys, it could be his liver, it could be his heart, it could be anything. But look at what it says now. The thorn in the flesh, who is the messenger of who? Satan. So God didn't give to him the thorn in the flesh, that person who persecutes him. Who sent that messenger? Satan. And it's right there. So Whenever Paul preached, Satan would send people to persecute him, to buffet him, to beat him, to castigate him, to be against him. All right? So why do you think Paul would do such a thing as that? I mean, why do you think Satan would do something like that to Paul? All right? Because some of these things, lest I should be exalted. Well, what does that mean, you see, all right? Okay, so now let's go back and read from verse 1. Okay, so now we'll get the full meaning of chapter 12. How to read your Bible. Okay? All right. It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Right? So first thing Paul says is, look, I'm not going to boast. I'm going to get visions and revelations of Jesus. All right? Verse 2, 
I know a man in Christ. He's talking about himself now. All right? Above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether I'm out of the body. So whether physical or spiritual, because he was caught up in heaven, and Jesus showed him revelations. He's talking about himself, all right? I cannot tell. God knows such as one caught up to the third heaven, all right? And I knew such a man. He's talking about himself. Of course, he knows himself. Whether the body out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words. Jesus revealed to him, revealed to him. And that's why Paul wrote all these books in the Bible. Because he was re it was revealed to him, revealed to him. Which it is not lawful for a man to utter. It's like, whoa, it is so great. These grace revelations, they are so great. I mean, you know, for a man to even utter it. Okay, now here comes what Paul wrote. He says, I've been given all of these revelations. And this is what Paul says, all right? Without verse 5, it's very hard to understand verse 7, all right? Of such an one will I boast of, will I glorify. Who do you think he is going, Paul is saying, I'm going to boast of somebody. Who do you think he is going to glorify or to boast of? All right? Glory here translates to boast, okay? I will boast of somebody. Yet of myself, I'm not going to boast of myself. I receive all of these revelations, but I'm not going to boast about, it, about myself. But in my infirmities, that means all my weaknesses. All right? For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that he hears of me. All right? So Paul says, I'm going to boast about someone, I'm not going to boast about myself. So who is that person that Paul says, I am going to boast about him? Jesus. So Paul is basically saying, look, every time I open my mouth, and I'm going to open my mouth everywhere I go. I don't care what comes against me. I'm going to boast and I'm going to talk about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm going to boast about Jesus. I'm going to tell everybody about Jesus and what he did on the cross for you. I'm going to tell him about what he did for you. I'm going to tell everybody about what Jesus did for you. All right? So every time Paul gets up, he's going to talk about Jesus. All right, he's going to boast about Jesus. Okay, now verse 7 comes. Look, he says, but somebody is going to come against me. That somebody doesn't like me to what? Boast about Jesus. Somebody, something is against me because if I stand up and I boast about Jesus all the time, without any persecution, without anybody coming against me, then this scripture would not be there. This verse, particular verse. So, once again, all right, Paul says, anytime I stand up, when I speak, I'm going to boast about Jesus. I'm not going to boast about myself. So that's what he says here. That I'm not going to boast... I'm not going to be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. All right? So now you understand what it means? He has been given all these revelations, but he's not going to boast about himself. But there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So something came against him. Someone, now you know, came against him. A messenger of Satan to buffet him to beat him, to punch him, to take him down. Because if you take Paul down, you have taken Jesus down. Because Paul now cannot boast about Jesus. So this has nothing to God giving Paul a disease. Paul is saying, I got all of these revelations. I'm going to boast not about myself, but I'm going to boast about Jesus. So Satan says, 
Yes, well, I cannot touch you directly, but I am the prince of this world, prince of the air. I am the ruler of this world, all right? So I can influence people to come against you. So anytime Paul stands up to boast about Jesus, there will be a messenger of Satan coming to take him down. And if he is taken down, he, if, if he is taken down, that means he cannot stand up and exalt if he cannot be doing that, what he was told to do, then he cannot boast about Jesus. So the moment you take down Paul, you take down Jesus. So the message of grace will not be shared. Look at it. It is so simple. Now next scripture. So, of course, Paul doesn't like it. He doesn't like the persecution. So he says, look, I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me, because I don't like these people coming against me. Every time I stand up, man, they want to stone me, they want to kill me, they want to do all sorts of things to my body. I don't like this. So he prayed against it. All right, and now let's look. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient oh, and people say look yeah you know for my strength is made perfect in weakness yeah you know paul that's why you are weak you are weak so that god you know my grace is sufficient for you to make you strong but no we already saw that that's not the meaning of that all right so what does it mean most gladly therefore i will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me okay let's define grace again Grace is given to people when they are weakest, when they have nothing. Grace is given to little children. Some people ask me, you know, my child passed away. Will he or she be in heaven? The answer is absolutely yes, because that's what the Bible says. You know, God says, such is the kingdom. Why? Because the little children cannot give anything back. The little children can only receive the grace. The moment you can pay back Jesus, it is no longer grace. Because grace is unmerited favor. That means the little child didn't do anything to deserve heaven. That's why the little child got grace anybody who cannot do anything anymore they receive grace that's why it says you know the maim the blind the ones who cannot walk you know all those people they cannot walk into the feast they cannot see so they say please help me jesus i cannot i cannot do anything jesus and Jesus says, look, all of these people, they come to the feast and they will feast because they cannot do it. Because it's not based upon merit. Grace has no merit attached to it. It is unmerited favor from God. So little children who cannot give anything back to God, God says, my grace for you, Jesus. And you say, but they didn't do anything. Exactly. They are undeserved. They, don't, they didn't pay back anything. And that's why God gave them 100% grace for them. So now Paul is asking to this thorn in the side, this person to be removed. All these people who are persecuting him, trying to kill him. He prayed to God and God says to him, wait a second. In, when you appear weak, when you cannot do anything, look, people are persecuting you, and you want to open your mouth to share Jesus, you want to open your mouth to share all these revelations, and people are coming against you, so you appear so weak, but that is when my grace works best. When you are weak, then everybody can see that my grace will make you strong, that you are strong in your weakness. Because weak means what? You cannot do it, right? 
If everybody can see how great Paul is, you know, Paul, seven feet, six inches tall, you know, full of muscles, you know, born from the land down under, you know, you, 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 wow, look at that, you know, the, the poster boy for the, for the guy selling the tractors and, you know, bulldozers, you know, you have this strong guy up there, full of muscles, seven feet, six, you know, Strip bear, you know, carrying a big hammer, and he says, "Look, this is Paul. Wow, Paul, that is great, man. You are so strong. So if you are so strong, don't need grace. But Paul, man, you are persecuted. You're stoned. When Paul stands up to speak, all cuts and bruises, you know, all sorts of things happening. Eyes weak, yes, because he's just been stoned, punched, kicked." thrown out of the city. And then God says, look, in this, everybody sees how weak you are, but let them see my grace for you. Let them see how strong you become because I am going to pour my grace for you. All right? So now let's read the scripture. My grace is sufficient for you. For what? And who is who strength? God's strength. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you are looking so weak, when you say, I cannot do this. Man, look at all these people who are always against me. They come, I speak, they stone me. So, Paul says, aha, I got it now. So most gladly, I will rather glory. I will now boast in oh, yeah, my weakness. I am so weak, but man, you know, God is so strong. I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ, come on, may rest upon me. Grace will be shown to me. All right, and the last verse. Therefore, I, come on, Take pleasure now, all right? It's not like he says, well, I have cancer and I take pleasure in it. He says, I take pleasure in my weakness. Man, I cannot do... All of these things are happening to me in reproaches, you see. Reproach you. Well, yeah, you are wrong, Paul. In necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, that's what he's describing. What he's going through. All the things that make him look so weak. For when I am weak, come on, then am I strong. And who made him strong? Jesus. And you see, when you read the Bible in its proper context, in the proper way, every statement should make sense. It should not contradict with another part of the Bible. And it should not contradict whereby you have, like I said, two types of message of God in your brain. God is good, but God gave Paul a disease. Well, then God cannot be good. So correct interpretation of the Bible is essential. And the only person who can give you an absolute correct interpretation of the Bible is the Holy Spirit, not man. It's not me. It's not some biblical scholar. It's not anybody, any man. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. So anytime there is confusion in the Bible, make sure you go back to the meaning as defined by the Holy Spirit. And when you see it, Suddenly, everything you read concerning the thorn in the flesh becomes obvious. You cannot miss it because the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Amen?